Good morning. We will uh, get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're working on uh, on work, <laughs> working on work and energy, and we will continue that. Uh, we'll do a little bit more just using work, and then we'll take the step forward and use energy as a whole, which I think most people find a little easier to deal with. Um, but we'll we'll look at both approaches. So let's let's do another example, like we were doing last time. We're going to have. Uh, a box sliding on an incline. <clears throat> so we'll make it uh, 10 kilograms. And it's going to go up uh, five meters starting at rest. Let's make that 30 degrees. Some friction, of course. <clears throat> okay, so what we want to do is find the work done by every force acting on our box. Uh, oh, there must, be, <laughs> there must be another force acting on our box if it starts moving. Uh, how about we'll have a pulling force here. Uh, there we go. Uh, the work done by every force acting on the box. And we want to find the final speed of the box. How fast is that box moving at the end of the five meters? Okay, have you drawn a free body diagram yet? <clears throat> Let's do a free body diagram. And then let's fill in this table. All right, we're okay with that. So have you filled in your table with, what do we have? We have a normal force, a friction force, a force of gravity, and a pulling force.
Okay, what do we get for the normal force? Zero. For friction, we have the friction force times the distance times the cosine of 180 degrees because the uh, displacement is up the incline and the friction force is down the incline. Mm. And that makes an angle of 180 degrees. Oh, what am I missing? Five. Is that about right? Gravity, have you done gravity yet? So what do we do for gravity? Well, we could break up gravity into the two components, right? We could say the work done by gravity is the work done by Fg uh, x plus the work done by Fgy. And one of them does no work, right? The, the perpendicular, let's, I'll use perpendicular parallel, I like that better. Uh, perpendicular and parallel. And the perpendicular component doesn't do any work, right? It's perpendicular to the motion. It doesn't have any component in the direction of motion. So this gives us um, mg sine theta. That's the force. The delta x is the displacement and cosine of 180 <clears throat> because when you put their tails together, they're pointing in opposite directions. Now you could have just done the whole force of gravity. That's okay too, whatever you like. And so what do I get here? I get uh, negative 245, I think. And my pulling force <clears throat> is going to be the force times the displacement cosine zero degrees. So I just get uh, five hundred joules. So what do we get here? We get um, <clears throat> 171 joules. And we say the net work equals the change in kinetic energy. That's always true. The net work done on an object is the change in kinetic energy of the object. Change in kinetic energy, that's the final minus the initial. And what is kinetic energy? It's one half mv squared. So one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. And we know it started from rest. So v initial was zero. So I plug in my numbers here. What am I getting? 171. 
mass was 10, right? I think it's about 5.83. Okay. Is it 170 instead of 171? You get the idea. <clears throat> okay. So there are, uh, <clears throat> there are some special forces in, uh, in physics. We call them conservative forces. And gravity is one of them. So let's, let's take a look at uh, the difference here. Conservative. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's take a look at gravity. says force <clears throat> and we're going to lift an object from A to B. So here's A and here's B. So there are a number of paths that we can take, right? Going from A to B. We can just lift it straight up. Start at A, height A, and lift it straight up to height B. That's one path we can take. And how much work does the uh, force of gravity do when we lift this object from A to B? We'll call this... Um, one, path one. If we lift it at constant speed, let's say that makes it easier. If we lift it at constant speed, then <clears throat> the force of gravity is acting down and the object is moving up. And so it's just going to be minus mg uh, times the difference here. Let's just call that. Uh, H minus MGH. We all good with that? Now let's take a different path. Let's, uh, let's overshoot. Let's go up higher and then come back down to B. So we're going we're gonna to do this one. We're going to start here and we're going to come up and then back down. We're going to end right there. And we'll call this distance here, we'll call that uh, y. <clears throat> so let's see what we've got. The work done, we'll call that path two. We could break this up into three sections, right? We've got this, this um, uh, red section here. And we've got the blue section where we go past, and then we've got uh, the green section over here where it comes back down, right? So this is going to be the work done on the red section. We just figured that out, right? Minus MGH. Plus the work done on the blue section, which is minus MGY. plus the work done on the green section, which is going to be plus MGY, because it's the force of gravity is down and it's moving down. So we get a cosine zero degrees. We get positive work done. That's the green section. And we add those up and what do we get? 
minus MGH. Let's do one more. Let's go, uh, let's see, I guess I'll, I'm just gonna move over a little bit and add another one here. So we're gonna start here and we'll move, uh, how about we go this way and then this way and then this way and we end up here. So we've lifted it from A to B, height A to height B, but we've taken this different path. We're gonna call this a path three. And the work done for path three is going to be the work done for this blue section, right? Plus the work done over the red section there, plus the work done on that green section. So the work done on the blue section is how much? The work done by gravity on our object, zero, right? It's not going up or down. So the force of gravity doesn't have any component in the direction of motion. Then we've got the red section, we've already done that, minus MGH. And then we've got the green section and it's also zero. And so what do we get when we add these up? Okay, you're getting the, the feeling that it's not gonna change. <laughs> Any path we take, we can take, uh, we can take this path if we want to. <clears throat> we can take any path and the work done is going to be the same. And when that's true, when the work done between points A and B is independent of the path taken, that's a special kind of force called a conservative force. So gravity is a conservative force. So the work does not depend on the path taken. Now let's do, um, let's take a look at a spring. So I've got a mass on a spring. And we're gonna, we're starting here and we wanna end up over here. <clears throat> so what's one path I can take to get from point A to point B? I can just take a straight line path, right? I can go right there, path one. Or I can do this, right? I can push it in and then pull it out over to path two. Or I can stretch it and bring it back and path three. I can take any number of paths from A to B, but it turns out that the work done is the same for all of them. This section, this section and the section opposite it, they end up canceling out. And so all we're left with is that one. The same is just going straight from A to B. And that's true for the other path also. So it turns out that this also is path independent. Spring force is a conservative Okay. 
How about uh, gravity? <laughs> gravity. How about uh, friction? Friction. So let's take a um, sort of a top down. We're going to look down from the from the ceiling, top down view of our uh, of a classroom. And we want to slide a box from point A to point B. We've got a box on the floor there. And we're going to slide it till it's over here. I guess we'll put it right on the point there. So this is path one. What's the work done by friction as we slide this box? from A to B along the floor. Okay, so it's, it's the friction force. That's the friction force, right? Mu times the normal force times the distance. I guess I should have put a distance on there. Use capital D. Distance between these two points, capital D. How's that? Um, times a cosine 180. And so what do we get? We get negative mu uh, M G D. Okay. Now we're going to take a different path. We're going to, instead of pushing it straight from A to B, we're going to push it first uh, along this section. Then we're going to push it. Uh, along this section. And then we're going to push it along this section. And so this we're going to call this uh, lowercase d. And we'll call that path two. And so what is this going to be? This is going to be the work done on the blue section, plus the work done on the red section, plus the work done on the green section, right? So what do we get? We have minus mu times the normal force times the distance, lowercase d, minus mu times the normal force times the distance over the red path and minus mu mg lowercase d over the green path. <clears throat> we add those up. We don't get the same work we got on path one, right? These are different. Not the same. So this is a non-conservative force.
<clears throat> uh, for the blue and the green, it is um, cosine 180 because the box is sliding, right? So let's look, just look at the blue path. Along the blue path, the box at any given instant is sliding in this direction, right? It's moving in that direction. And what direction is friction? Friction is opposite that. So when you put the tails of those two vectors together, you get 180 degrees. Okay. All right, so non-conservative, the work does depend on the path taken. Conservative, the work does not depend on the path taken. And every time we see a conservative force, these are the only two you're gonna see this quarter. Next quarter, you'll see the electric force is also a conservative force. But this quarter, we have two, gravity and the spring force. So every time we see a conservative force, let's say any, any conservative force, we decide to come up with a potential energy term for it. Because it doesn't matter what path we take to get from one point to the other. So let's just look at our starting and ending point and ignore what happens in between. That's what potential energy does for us. We can ignore the path, just look at where we started and where we ended and use those two values to come up with the change in energy or the work done. So let's see how we get that. Well, how do we get that? We find the work done going from point A to point B by our conservative force. So let's do, um, so in general, our work done is the integral of f dot dx, right? <clears throat> let's do it for gravity. For gravity, the force is constant. So it's just equal to f times delta y or dot product with delta y. Delta X, I'll call it X. You get the idea. It's, it's the direction of motion for gravity. I'll put F sub G there. Because the force of gravity is constant over the distances we're talking here, right? And so what do we get? We get something like this. Uh, And we call this guy, we say, let's just call that potential energy, U. So work done always ends up being negative change in potential energy. If you get all your signs right, I'm, I'm not being too careful with my signs here. If you get all your signs right, work is negative delta U. And that's how we define potential energy. We look at the work done and see what we end up with. So we could do the same thing for a spring. This is gravity. For a spring, we say the work done, integral f dot dx. And here you have to, I'm gonna, I'll try to be careful with my signs, but what's important is what we end up with at the end. So if, you, if you're careful with your signs, 
kx dot dx, you need to write it like a vector equation. You end up with a minus one half kx final squared plus a one half kx initial squared, and you get a minus, and I'll something like that. So we're going to call this u spring. We're just going to define that as u spring. And so this is minus delta u. So I'm, I'm using sp for springs. Some books use e for elastic. Those are the same. I usually use this for electric, electric potential energy. Next quarter, we're going to have an electric potential energy. And so I usually use UE for electric potential energy and SP for spring potential energy. If you write the equation, this is Hooke's law is this. If you write it as a vector equation, because these are vectors, the displacement and the force are always opposite. If you take a spring and you stretch it in one direction, the spring pulls back in the other direction, right? If you take the spring and you compress it by pushing it this way, the spring pushes back the other way, right? They're always opposite. It's, it's really a vector equation. But the vectors, it's kind of useless in everyday calculations. Uh, unless you're doing some kind of special equation that's a vector equation. So over here, we're doing a vector equation, right? We're doing a dot product between two vectors. So if you're a little more careful with your signs, that it works out, the math works out, trust me. But normally when you use this equation, it, just, it doesn't make sense to have the negative sign in there because you can look at this, a spring and know whether it's pulling or pushing, right? If it's stretched, it's pulling. If it's compressed, it's pushing, right? You, you know the direction. So I always just go like this. I, I always just use it as a magnitude. When I'm using it in normal calculations to try to find a spring force, I just use F equals KX. I, I ignore the fact that it's a vector equation. Okay, so we have spring potential, we have gravitational potential energy, and we have spring potential energy. Did I put a big box around this somewhere? I should do that, yeah. Okay, those are our potential energies. Now, the, uh, the uh, potential energy of a spring One half kx squared, remember that k is our spring constant, right? The spring constant that depends on the spring. If it's really hard to stretch, k is a big number. If it's really easy to stretch, k is a small number. This is always positive. A spring has energy stored in it or it doesn't. It doesn't matter whether that spring is stretched or compressed. Either way, it has energy stored in it 
spring potential energy always positive, one half kx squared. But a spring can do work on something. How much work does a spring do? One half kx squared, right, is the work done by the spring. Now the work done by the spring can be positive or negative. I'm gonna put a plus or minus here. So let's think about that. Let's just look at, at a few situations, okay? Uh, A. Situation A, we've got a spring and a mass. And um, it's going to start out at, uh, at rest at the equilibrium position of the spring, OK? Now we're going we're gonna to move it. We're going to uh, push it in, OK? So we're going to. We're gonna push, push the, the box and compress that spring, okay? Now we will uh, go to, to position C. We will go back to, we're gonna let go and the spring is going to push the box out. So now it's going to have some velocity in this direction. So we'll let go. And box moves to Right. Now, the box has some inertia, so it keeps going past the equilibrium position, and the spring brings it to rest because they're connected. And so out here, the spring comes to rest, the box comes to rest. And then what happens, it, it ends up getting pulled back. Box moves to the left. Okay, so let's take a look at each case here. So this is, um, we want to know the work done uh, by the spring on the box, right? Going from A to B. Going from A to B. Is the spring doing positive work, negative work, or no work on the box going from A to B? It's doing negative work. Because as the box is moving to the left, the spring is compressed. It's pushing back to the right. 
So the spring force is opposite the direction of motion. It's doing negative work. Now, going from B to C. Is the spring doing positive work on the box, negative work on the box, or no work on the box? Positive. Because the spring is in a compressed state. So if a spring is compressed, it's pushing back towards its equilibrium position, and the box is moving toward the equilibrium position. So they're in the same direction, positive work. Okay, now the box has inertia, it keeps going past the equilibrium position of the spring. So now the spring is in a stretched state. So what's the work done for going from C to D? You can see this is going to be negative again because the spring is in a stretched state. So when the spring becomes stretched, it pulls back towards its equilibrium position. The box is moving in one direction to the right. The spring is pulling back to the left toward the equilibrium position, slowing the box down, right? Doing negative work on the box. And the last case, work going from D to E. Positive, because the spring is stretched. Whenever a spring is stretched, it's pulling back towards its equilibrium position. And the box is moving in that direction toward the equilibrium position. So they're both in the same direction, we get positive work done. Okay, so you can see here, a spring, it doesn't matter whether it's stretched or compressed. Here, the spring is compressed and doing negative work. And here it's compressed and doing positive work, okay? Here it's stretched and doing negative work. And here it's stretched and doing positive work. It does not matter, stretched or compressed. What matters is, is the force in the same direction as the motion. If they're in the same direction, the work is positive. If they're opposite, it's negative. Okay, you have to just look at the situation. So work done by a spring on an object can be positive, can be negative, but the energy stored in a spring, the potential energy of the spring, always positive. A spring, if it's stretched, it has energy stored in it. If it's compressed, it has energy stored in it. Always positive. You spring, always positive. Work done by a spring, you have to look at the situation, positive or negative. Work is zero when it does not move through any distance, right? When there's no motion. So for example, if I just hang, if I just hang an object from a spring and it's just sitting there at rest, then the spring is doing no work on that object while it's sitting there, right? The force, it's applying a force, right? You've got gravity, you've got a spring force, but that force is not moving through any distance. It's just, just staying there. So no work, work equals zero for this case. Yes, <clears throat> question is, if, uh, if at the end of this cycle, what's the total work done? It's zero, 
total work done by the spring on the box is zero at the end of this whole cycle because the box is right back where it started. So the work done by the spring all canceled out. And, and the only difference is that we reached in with our hand and did some work between A and B, right? How did it get moving from A to B? We reached in with our hand and did some work on the system. And that energy stays in the system and, and now the box is moving. So down here, you might say, oh, wait a minute, why is the box moving now? Well, it's because we reached in at the very beginning step and added some energy to the system by doing some work on the system. But the spring, all the spring energy uh, ended up canceling to zero when we got back to our starting point. Because it's a conservative force. Okay. Um, usually non-conservative forces are things that uh, sort of dissipate energy or to convert energy into other types. So friction, air resistance, um, things like that. Uh, we usually just clump those into our non-conservative forces. In this quarter, uh, well, I guess we could deal with air resistance this quarter. So friction and air resistance. Okay, so what we wanna do now is put this together. So uh, physicists don't come up with things like potential energy to make your life as a physics student miserable. They come up with things like this because it makes their lives easier, right? They found that it's easier to solve problems when you deal with a, an energy approach. And so you come up with these energy terms and, uh, and deal with them that way. And it's a little weird because Energy is, a, is an odd thing, right? It's, it's, it looks very um, uh, disjointed, right? We have energy of motion. We have energy stored in a spring. Energy because of something's position in a gravitational field. Uh, uh, things can do work, friction, heat uh, energy, thermal energy. So it, it seems very disjointed. Th things that don't seem to relate at all. We're using energy to describe both of them. But it's kind of the, the analogy we use in physics a lot is money. <laughs> money also could appear that way to someone who's never seen it before. We have coins, we have uh, paper money, we can write a check, you can take out a credit card and buy something, right? It appears that we have very strange, uh, different, very different types of money. Some people barter and trade things and, instead of using money. Um, so all different ways, but all of it gives you the ability to buy something, right? Money sort of has this common, uh, the ability to buy something. And energy has the ability to do work. So, um, so it, it has something in common at an underlying level. And what we want to do is think about it on this big picture because if our system is closed, kind of like money, right? If we were all sitting in a classroom together and we locked the doors, the amount of money in the room is a fixed amount. It's not going to change, right? And it's the same with our systems. If our system, if when we draw our system boundary and think about what's in our system, if nothing is reaching into our system, nothing is leaving our system, then the amount of energy in the system is a fixed amount. Now, the energy may get transferred from one object to another or transformed from one kind to another, but the amount of energy in our system is a fixed amount. Just like if we were all sitting in a classroom together and we locked the doors, we might have a big rumble. Some of us might leave the room with more money than we came in with. Some might leave the room with less, but the total amount of money is fixed, right? It's not going to change. So it's the same with energy. 
They can get moved around. It can get transferred from one object to another. They can get transformed from one type to another. It can change from kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy or something like that. But if nothing is reaching into our system, then the amount is fixed. Okay. All right. Let's take a uh, let's take a ten minute break, and we'll come back and uh, work on more energy conservation problems. Okay, we're back. So uh, potential energy is an interaction energy. It uh, accounts for interactions within our system. We'll take a closer look at that right now. So let's take a look at this example. We've got a, um, a uh, inclined surface. And we're moving our box from one point to another here along, along the surface. So the box moves at constant speed up our incline. We're pushing this way. I'll call that F hand. We're reaching in with our hand and pushing on the, our block. The pushing force is horizontal. The angle here is theta, and we're going um, one meter. Okay, so <clears throat> if I were to draw a system schema here, I've got my block, my box, and the earth, right? And I've got the hand. So the hand is reaching over and pushing on the box. There's a contact force right there between the two of them, right? The box is interacting with the earth through a contact force. And we usually, when, there, when we think about the contact force with the earth, we usually split that up into a normal force and a friction force, right? So I draw that as this double arrow, contact force, normal force and friction force. But it's really, it's really one interaction with the surface of the Earth, right? And then there's a non-contact force. There's the force of gravity. And that's everything. So let's pick a system boundary. Typically, we like to include the Earth because then we can use potential energy, gravitational potential energy. If the Earth is in our, in our system, then we can use potential energy because it's an interaction between objects within the system. And why did physicists invent potential energy? Because it's easier typically than thinking about it in other ways. If the earth is not in our system, we cannot use potential energy. We have to think of it as an external force reaching into our system and treat it as a separate force. Okay, so I'm gonna draw my system boundary right here. I'm gonna include the earth. But what I do when I have, whenever I have a hand reaching into my system or one end of a rope, only one end of a rope, I treat that as an external force, something reaching into my system. So I'm going to draw my system boundary here. Now let's draw our free body diagrams or diagram. There's only one. for our box. I'll give you a minute to do it.
we'll have a normal force and we'll have friction. We've got the force of gravity. And we've got our pushing force, F hand. So I'm going to break up some of these forces into their components. I'm going to choose the direction of my incline as one of my directions. So the normal force is already in that coordinate system. I've got friction is already in that coordinate system. I'm going to break up gravity into m g sine theta, m g cosine theta. And I'm going to break up the force from the hand into F hand parallel and F hand perpendicular. And what are F hand parallel and F hand perpendicular? The uh, parallel component is going to be uh, cosine theta, right? And the perpendicular component is sine theta. You just have to look at this is this is theta right here, right? <clears throat> so in a free body diagram, I wasn't too much of a stickler on this on the exams, but you should do one or the other. Either you are having a force of gravity there, or you have components. But you should never have both, right? Because every vector, vector, every arrow in your free body diagram is a force acting on your object. And you don't have both this one and this one and this one, right? You don't have all three of those. You have either the components or the main, the, the, the real force, right? So you should have one or the other, you should not have both. So either one of these would be acceptable. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move forward. We are, so let's, uh, let's let um, uh, the distance was given, right? Delta X is one meter. And uh, let's let M be uh, 10 kilograms and theta be 30 degrees and F hand can be uh, 100 Newtons. What else do we use? Uh, I think I used 10 here for all my calculations. So the question is, What's the question? Find the coefficient of friction. I'll say given, given this stuff, find mu. Okay, so we're gonna, first we're gonna do it using the approach that we did the last day or so. We're gonna find the work done by every force acting on our box, and we're gonna use the work kinetic energy theorem, okay? So we'll use our plan here. Use We'll use the work kinetic energy theorem. We'll find the net work done and use the work kinetic energy theorem. And we know the change in kinetic energy is zero. This thing is moving at constant speed up the incline. All right, so let's do that. I'm gonna make a little table. 
the force and the work done on the box by that force. I'll do the easy one for you. Okay, you do the next one. Box is going up. Yeah. You might have to use some of the forces in the perpendicular direction is zero, right? To get your normal force. So your normal force is equal to, we're looking at this direction, right? So the normal force is pointing up and mg cosine theta and f hand perpendicular are pointing down. So normal force has to equal the sum of the other two, the normal, the mg cosine theta plus f hand perpendicular. One hundred and thirty seven Newtons, close enough. I, I said, I think I used G as ten when I did this. And uh, and we don't know mu, so I'm just gonna leave mu in there, right? If I knew mu, I would plug it in, but I don't I don't know mu. Uh, where that's what we're solving for. Okay, what's next? We've got a force of gravity, right? Mg sine theta, delta x, Cosine 180. I got minus 50 joules. And the hand. You can just use the whole force of the hand and the cosine of theta. And I got positive 87. Force of gravity, you can do a number of different ways, right? You can, you can use this force right here. You can say, I have a force of gravity that does this, and my box is doing this, right? 
And so this angle here is 90 plus theta. So what is the work done by the force of gravity? It's the force of gravity, all of it, mg. times delta x times the cosine of the angle when you put their tails together. I'm running out of room here. Oh, I just got more room. This, this you could do it this way. What is the cosine of uh, 90? plus theta, it's negative sine theta. Okay, so you get, you get the same answer if you do it that way, or you can break up the force of gravity into its components. That's what I did. I said the force of gravity can be broken up into the two components. This one does no work, right? That's perpendicular to the motion. It does no work. So I didn't use it. I knew it did zero work. And this one does do work, mg sine theta. So I use that force going down and the displacement going up, and I got a cosine of 180 degrees there. Okay. So what do I, oh, here I am. I'm ready to add these up, right? So work uh, zero minus 137 minus 50 plus 87. I get about um, not 137, 137 mu, 137 mu, there we go. And then I said this has to equal, what does this have to equal? It has to equal zero, right? There's no work being done here. And so we get 137 mu is 37. or mu is about 0.27. We okay? So we're done with this problem. They asked for mu sub k, and we found it using the approach that we know so far, right? We looked at the work done by every force acting on our object, added them up to get the net work done, and set that equal to the change in kinetic energy. Constant velocity. Okay. Now, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about using an energy approach to solve this problem. Mechanical energy, that's what we were dealing with. E. So what kinds of mechanical energy do we know about right now? Kinetic energy, energy of motion, and two potential energies, gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy or elastic potential energy. <clears throat> so K, U, G, U spring. 
And that's it. That's all we know about right now. <clears throat> so this approach, though, is very powerful because it will expand as our knowledge of the world, our view of the world becomes more realistic and we start including other things. So when we say our mechanical energy, our total mechanical energy is kinetic energy plus gravitational potential plus spring potential, we're sort of saying that, well, we don't know about charged objects, how charged objects interact, right? We don't know about other things. But next quarter, when we start learning about charged objects, we can just add a term. We can say our, our energy is K plus UG plus U spring plus U electric, right? We can just add a term there. And so this technique, conservation of energy, just keeps kind of expanding as we learn more about interactions and how to account for them. And, uh, and the, the, the skill set that you're learning is the same skill set, though. It's just the equations become a little bit longer, but the, the thought process is the same. So what we would like to say, right, what would be really nice is if the energy didn't change, right? The initial energy and the final energy were the same. That's that we sort of, we want... Initial mechanical energy equals final mechanical energy. But we know that's not always the case, right? What could change that? Friction could change that, right? So I have, uh, I have a box sitting on the floor of the classroom. I kick it, it starts to move, right? We've got a box moving. And then a couple of seconds later, it's not moving anymore. What happened? <laughs> it had kinetic energy, now it doesn't have kinetic energy. Friction dissipated some of that energy. It turned it into heat, and we, we don't really know how to account for heat yet, right? So uh, it turned into thermal energy. So it's not mechanical anymore. So that can change this. So we need to account for that somewhere. So I would add a term here. I would say my initial energy friction might change this. So. So we have to account for that. We want to, how do we keep this equal sign there? We have E initial, we have E final, we have an equal sign. I would add the work done by friction. Does that look right? Is friction going to make us end up with more energy or less mechanical energy at the end? Less. We will end up with less mechanical energy at the end of our problem than at the beginning if we have friction in our system. Why did I put it on the left side of the equation? Because it's negative. That's exactly right. So I'm just going to write that here. Okay. Now, so we've accounted for that. Now there's one other thing we need to account for. What else can change the mechanical energy in our system? Yes, something can reach in. Energy can enter our system if we allow something to reach in or energy can leave our system, right? So energy can enter or leave the system.
So we need to account for that. So we have E plus work friction. We have E final. So where do I want to put the work done by external forces? I'm going to put it right here. The work done by external forces. So if a hand reaches in and does work on the system, adds energy to the system, like what happened up here, where was that spring example? Oh, right here. Right, what happened? Right here, a hand reached in, pushed the box up against the spring and added energy to that spring, right? And then we let go and we let the thing oscillate back and forth, back and forth. So it added energy to the system. It did positive work on the system. And so we ended up at the end with more mechanical energy. So where do we put the work done by the external force? We put it on the left side of the equation, right? Correct? So whatever we started with, if this is positive, if, if the force adds energy to the system, the work done by external forces would be positive, and then you end up with more mechanical energy at the end, right? So that's why it's on the left side of the equation. And if, if we pulled energy out of the system, if the work done by external forces is negative, then you're gonna, of course, end up with less mechanical energy. So the work done by external forces shows up on the left side of the equation the way I drew it here. So what I like to do is think about, I make a little, uh, I make an energy bar chart. Uh, so I've got my initial conditions. I've got my final conditions. And then I've got what happens in between. or during, whatever you want to call it. So my initial conditions are, is just my E initial, my mechanical energy at the beginning. So what, how much, what kinds of mechanical energy do I know about? Only three, right? Kinetic, gravitational potential, spring potential. So this could be kinetic, could be UG, could be U spring. That's it, that's the only three kinds I know about. And at the end, I could have kinetic, gravitational potential, or spring potential. Okay, so this, this is over here. And this one is over here. So what happens in between? Well, this is what happens in between, right? So I've got to have my work done by friction and my work done by external forces. And where's my equal sign? My equal sign is right here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a little bar chart. And this is zero, this is positive, this is negative. So kinetic energy. Did my object have, remember what the situation was? We've been talking about energy for a little bit. We have a box sliding up an incline at constant speed, okay? Box sliding up an incline at constant speed. So does it have kinetic energy at the beginning of this problem? Yes, it does, it's moving. If it's moving, it has kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is always positive, right? One half mv squared, always positive. So I'm gonna put a positive bar here. That's just to remind me, I've got kinetic energy and it's positive. How about gravitational potential energy? Does my object go up or down in this problem? 
Yes, it goes up. So that means that at the end, because it's higher up at the end, where is my picture? Because it goes higher up at the end, it has to have more gravitational potential energy. Remember, as the farther you are away from the center of the Earth, the more gravitational potential energy you have. So it has to have more at the end than it started with. Now, gravitational potential energy, all we care about are differences. As long as we all have the same difference, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what you call zero. So for example, if I'm gonna drop my pen and I wanna know how fast is my pen going right before it hits the table, I might say the table is zero height and my pen is a half a meter above the table and I can use that to calculate how fast it's going the split second before it hits the table. You might say, no, the floor is zero height and the pen is one and a half meters above the floor and when it gets to the table, it's one meter above the floor, but you still are gonna get a change of a half a meter. I could even say the ceiling is zero height and use the, the, the positions relative to the ceiling. As long as I, my potential energy gets smaller as I get closer to the earth and bigger as I go away from the center of the earth, that's all that matters. I can use any point of zero. So what makes sense in this problem, either the beginning or the end, most students would pick the lowest point. So let's pick the lowest point and call it zero. Where's the lowest point? At the beginning. So I'm gonna call the beginning zero potential energy for gravitational potential energy. <clears throat> and, uh, and that means at the end, oh, let's talk about the end. That means at the end, it has to have more. It has to be higher up. What's more than zero? A positive amount, right? So this is some positive amount here. Okay. If I had called zero at the end, I could have done that, right? I could have said at the end I have zero. So what would I have at the beginning? A negative amount. That's okay. Most students don't like that though, <laughs> but that's okay. You could do that. But let's just call the lowest point zero. Let's keep it simple. Call the lowest point zero. And if you go above that, it's positive. Now, what about kinetic energy? I forgot to do the final kinetic energy. Is it moving at the end? Yes, it's moving at the end. If it's moving, it has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy always positive. In fact, it's the same as it was at the beginning because it's moving at the same speed. But I don't worry so much about the heights of these. I don't, you know, usually you can't tell what's more, what's less. What's important is that you have a value in there, you know that there's kinetic energy, and you know it's positive. Do I have any springs in my system? No, then they don't have any energy in them, right? Can't have energy in a spring if I have no spring. So uh, let's just call that zero. All right, and uh, do I have friction? Do I have friction in my system? Yes, I do. So I've got work done by friction and that is going to be negative. And do I have any external forces? See, I've, I've drawn my system. Where's my system? There, uh, no, 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 here it is. Here's my system. I've included the earth in my system. That's why I'm using gravitational potential energy. And so I will not count that as an external force. It's one or the other. Either the earth is reaching in and doing work on the box as it goes up, or you are accounting for that interaction as gravitational energy changing, but not both. So I included the earth in my system, and because I included the earth in my system, I, I'm allowed to use UG here. If I did not include the earth in my system, I would not have any gravitational energy. These would both be zero. And what would I have? I'd have work done by, by the force of gravity as an external force acting on my system. So it's one or the other, but usually it's more convenient to just include it in the system. That's why physicists invented it. So you would use it. 
So include it in the system, include the earth in the system. So the only force I have reaching through my boundary here is this one. So that's the only force that's crossing that boundary line. That's an external force reaching into my system. And so I've got the work done by that external force. So I'm gonna have to put something here. What's it gonna be, positive or negative? In this case, it's positive. The hand is pushing the box in the same direction it's moving. It's doing positive work on the box. It's adding energy to the system. We could have had the hand pushing down if the box was moving up and the hand pushing down, slowing it down, doing negative work on it. But we had the hand pushing it up the incline. OK, good. So let's just uh, one more time real quick. I'm going to draw it right here. I'm going to redraw my system schema. Just so I can point out a couple of things here. Okay, so this, this is an interaction energy. So I have gravitational potential energy because the earth is in my system. And this one over here is an external force reaching in. And so I account for it as external work, work done by an external force. If I chose a different system, if I had uh, excluded the earth, then I, my bar chart would look a little different. OK, why do we do the bar chart? Because it helps us get our equation right. And that's the whole goal here, the equation. And we get this from our bar chart. Uh, what do I have? Let me just look here. Kinetic energy. I've got a kinetic energy term. I've got friction. I'm just going along here. Friction is next. And that's going to be a negative, right? Um, so I'm going to have a negative friction force times distance. And then I've got uh, F hand cosine theta times the distance, positive, right? Work done by external forces. Then I have my equal sign. And then I have kinetic energy. I'm gonna, let me change this initial kinetic energy. One half K V initial squared. And then I have gravitational energy. <clears throat> so all I need now, everything I know except for one thing, Y, MGY. This is the vertical the vertical distance, the block changed. And so I have to figure out what that is. Yeah. So the block is going up an incline, right? Oops, thank you. Thank you. That's an M. M. One half MV squared. That's, I was thinking kinetic energy and uh, 
And then I changed it to one half mv squared, and then I combined the two. Okay, there we go, m, thank you. So here's our incline. And it's going from here to here, right up the incline. This is the distance of one uh, delta x. I'll just call it delta x. So we want to know this distance, y. And y is going to be delta x sine theta. So I can put that in for my y. So I'm going to do it one more time, but I'm going to define my system differently. I'm not going to include the Earth, just so you see what happens. Okay, so let's take a look at our bar chart. And you'll see in the end, you'll end up with the same We'll end up with the same thing. So I've got a K U, G, U, I'm going to just go ahead and write them all out. I know there are no springs in my system. But. And now for work external, I'm going to end up, you'll see, I'm going to end up with two. All right, so what are these things? Let's see, we've got at the beginning and the end, the object is moving. So we have kinetic energy, kinetic energy always positive. I have no gravitational energy anytime because the Earth is not part of my system. So this is zero. And this is zero. I have no spring potential energy because there are no springs in my system. I have friction. So the work done by friction is going to be negative. And I have two external forces reaching into my system. I have one here. And I have one here. So the hand is doing positive work, right? Pushing the box in the same direction it's moving, doing positive work. And gravity is doing, what color do I use for blue? Gravity is doing negative work. As the box goes up the incline, gravity is pulling it down. So this would give me, in the end, the exact same equation. Because what would I end up with? Over here, what happened? This, this thing here ended up moving to the other side of the equation and becoming negative. It's the exact same equation. But so either way, you want to think about it but it's better to include potential energy. So include the earth in your system. 
we'll use that as a uh, as potential energy and then things that are reaching into the system like a hand one end of a rope things like that we'll deal with as external forces Potential energy is always positive for, uh, for what? For a spring, it's always positive. For a gravitational potential energy, it could be positive or negative. But we don't have, in this case, we don't have any gravitational potential energy. We only have work done by the force of gravity. So that could be positive or negative regardless. But use of G could be negative. That's fine. You can define uh, the top of, of the final height to be zero. But it's, if it starts lower than that, it has to have less gravitational energy. Well, what's less than zero? A negative number, right? Because energy is a scalar, right? So a negative number is less than a positive number. Work done by gravity is negative because the box is going up the hill. The box is going up. What direction does gravity pull? Down, right? So we got a 180 degrees here. Cosine of 180 is negative. <clears throat> What's the situation where you want to exclude the Earth? Um, I can't think of one. <laughs> I can't think of one. Usually it's easier to, to use, use your potential energy terms here. So, I mean, they're there. We kind of invented them for a reason. They're there. Use them. If I have a spring in my system, I like to use spring potential energy and not treat it like an external force. If I have the earth there, gravity, I like to treat it as use of G and not as an external force. And then if I do, otherwise you start to get lots of external forces, right? And it, it, maybe that's more complicated too. This way it helps organize you. So what I recommend is writing out the bar chart as you do these. What happens if you have two springs in your system? Well, then you have a U spring one and a U spring two, okay? You'd have two terms there. What happens if you have two masses in your system? Then you have a K1 and a K2 and a K1 and a K2 at the end, and a UG1 and a UG2 because they both might be going up and down, right? So this, this bar chart, it just expands to, if your system becomes a little more complicated, it just expands. What happens if we have a pulley that has mass. A pulley can have mass eventually. In a couple of weeks, our pulleys are going to have mass. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the exact same bar chart, only we're going to have a kinetic energy term here. We're going to add in a K pulley, kinetic energy for the pulley. Because if a, if a pulley has mass and it's spinning, the mass is moving. It's got kinetic energy. Okay, so this, this same bar chart and equations for energy conservation will just expand them and include more complicated systems, systems with multiple masses, with pulleys, uh, multiple objects going up and down, multiple springs. We can use the same process for figuring all of that out. Uh, Okay, so next time we will do uh, a system where we have more than one mass. That's what we'll do next time. And I recommend, like I said, I recommend doing this bar chart. At least, you know, do it a number of times. It really helps give you a visual. It helps make sure you have 
you know, one, two, three, four, five terms in your equation when you write it out. Two of them are negative. So it helps you spot those things so you don't make a silly mistake like missing a minus sign. And then, you know, as your systems, like later on in the quarter, once you've done this a number of times, and later on in the quarter, you're just trying to do some simple energy thing, you're probably not gonna write out an energy bar chart, I know that. But it's, it's like training wheels right now to help us, help us get that going and do it right and uh, get the equation right. Uh, what's, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. In the end, potential energy is zero. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, yes, because there is no potential energy ever in the problem because the earth is not part of our system. So potential energies uh, account for interactions within our system. And I only have one object in, our, in my system, so it can't interact with itself, right? There are no energy interaction energies. So I can't have any potential energies if this is my definition for system. I can only have uh, potential energies if I have other objects in the system. Uh, if a spring and a mass hanging from a ceiling without external force. Will the spring keep oscillating? The spring will keep oscillating if, if we um, if we're ignoring uh, friction and air resistance, the, the spring will keep oscillating. And the energy just gets transformed back and forth between gravitational energy and kinetic energy and, and spring potential energy. It's called an oscillator. So if we go back and look at this system, where is it? Oop, right there. If we go back and look at this system, a mass on a spring, if, if we have a frictionless surface and no air resistance, we start, we give this thing a push, uh, we start it moving, it will oscillate back and forth forever. And at some point in the motion, the spring has no energy, right? When does that? Like right here. There's no energy in the spring, no spring potential energy. Where's all the energy? in the kinetic energy of the mass. And then at another point out here, there's no kinetic energy. All the kinetic energy is in the spring now, stored in the spring. And the energy just goes back and forth, spring potential energy, kinetic energy, spring potential, kinetic. And it just goes back and forth. Sometimes it has both, right? Sometimes it's in between and it's moving and the spring has some energy, right? But it'll oscillate back and forth like that forever. If there's no if there's no way for the energy to lose, right? No friction, no air resistance. We know in the real world that won't go forever. Okay. So I'm going to stop the uh, recording. I'll stick around to answer some questions.